Thank you. I'm especially happy to be back at the Army War College, uh, which plays such an important role in preparing senior leadership of the armed forces, and it's a privilege to speak to you. Uh, my subject today is a huge one, uh, and I'll only discuss some highlights that may serve to provoke some discussion uh, at the end. I'll consider four questions. Uh, first, what are the obstacles to formulating and executing grant strategy? Uh, second, where is American uh, grant strategy now? Third, what are the forces that will reshape the current trajectory? And fourth, what should we aim for, in my opinion? Uh, there are a lot of obstacles to real grant strategy. Uh, theorists and armchair field marshals always talk about grant strategy, but is there really such a thing? And if there is, uh, can one really engineer it for the long haul? Uh, in theory, grant strategy is the general plan for applying a nation's resources to the achievement of its policy objective. Now, this is a very broad and all-encompassing concept. Uh, Robert Art, in his book, A Grand Strategy for America, puts it this way. Grand strategy, like foreign policy, deals with the momentous choices that a nation makes in foreign affairs, but it differs from foreign policy in one fundamental respect. To define a nation's foreign policy uh, is to lay out the full range of goals that a state should seek in the world and then determine how all of the instruments of statecraft, political power, military power, economic power, ideological power, should be integrated and employed with one another to achieve those goals. Grand strategy concentrates primarily on how the military instrument should be employed to achieve those goals. Uh, I'd modify uh, Robert Art's formulation to include all instruments of force, which would add covert political intervention or intelligence operations to military power. Well, that's what grand strategy is supposed to be, and it's important in principle for a country to decide on a sensible and feasible grand strategy if it's to make wise foreign policy investments and avoid waste of blood and treasure. Uh, we may even have had a grand strategy that served well enough in the Cold War, containment and deterrence. At least since then, uh, however, uh, I fear that I'm not excessively cynical in saying that when military leaders look for guidance from a clear and settled grand strategy, they won't find it. They'll find vague and glittering generalities and motherhood statements. Or they'll find clear statements from one source that are questioned or contradicted by formulations from another source. Or they'll find a coherent grand strategy determined by authorities at one time that's overridden by new authorities who change course before that strategy has had time uh, to take effect. And if grand strategy exists, where is it written? In the official White House National Security Strategy document that Congress has required in recent years? That document has usually been an exercise in rhetoric, cheerleading for a laundry list of good things the United States would like to make happen in the world, uh, but without clarity or focus about priorities or hard choices, or details about exactly which types of capabilities should be deployed, where or how to implement plans. Uh, the emphasis in official rhetoric is usually on objectives rather than strategy per se. As a practical matter, the bureaucratic process of defining strategy for the document has often made it a Christmas tree on which every department hangs its favorite initiatives, uh, and for which no practical implementing, or monitoring, or enforcing mechanisms exist. The first post-Cold War president, Bush the Elder, held up a new world order as the guiding concept. But the extent and boundaries of the American leadership that implied weren't spelled out. Uh, this was, in my view, an evasion of limits that violates basic requirements of strategy. But it's an evasion that uh, has also characterized the articulations of grand strategy in administrations that followed. Clinton's buzzwords, engagement and enlargement, were a different bumper sticker, but a rather amorphous grand strategy. The following Bush administration's shift to what it called preemptive strategy uh, in rationalizing its original decision to attack Iraq in 2003 muddied the waters in a different way, since the strategy was really not preemptive, but preventive, a crucial distinction with big implications for both the legitimacy uh, 
uh, and the effectiveness of Bush's use of force. The Obama administration hasn't promoted a simple bumper sticker idea as official grant strategy. And although not articulating a concept clearly uh, may seem to be a failure of grant strategy, I think this more cautious approach uh, might be an improvement over the last two. Now these limitations aren't unique to recent presidencies. Uh, there are several chronic problems in putting grant strategy together in the United States. Now with the terribly important exception of the wars in which we've been recently engaged, current circumstances in the world allow political leaders to avoid hard choices. The United States enjoys unprecedented global primacy uh, or hegemony or unipolarity or whatever you want to call being number one with no competitors in the same league. Uh, in the view of some, this position in the relative distribution of national power is dominance on a scale not seen since the Roman Empire. Uh, as time goes on, and we're now more than 20 years past the end of the Cold War, it's easy for Americans to forget how unique this advantage is and to magnify the challenges we face as if they're as daunting as what we faced in the 20th century. Uh, as difficult as the problems that should drive grand strategy are, it's important not to forget that unlike other major states now or in the past, we face no threats capable of constraining a determined effort to apply conventional military power if American leaders decide to make such an effort. But it's equally important not to confuse that fact with a warrant for expansive ambitions uh, and a grand strategy that overreaches, not to confuse primacy with omnipotence. Now, at least until the caution uh, induced by the frustrating inability to suppress unconventional warfare easily in Iraq and Afghanistan, in the luxury of the post-Cold War unipolar world, American political leaders did not feel compelled to make decisions that write off any desirable objectives. They could decide that some objectives are just nice to have uh, rather than need to have, but they didn't have to forswear anything that they cared much about. Uh, with primacy, therefore, there's been an underlying permissive quality in policy that risks making grand strategy a catch-all, a highest common denominator approach to choice. Incentives for retrenchment have returned because of the frustrating wars, and especially because of the economic disaster that has imposed demands for cuts in government spending. But the lack of really powerful opposition, opposition by other great powers, as distinct from irritating but weak opponents like North Korea, Iran, and Al-Qaeda, still means that nothing clearly blocks ambitious notions of the American role in shaping world order. This permissive situation accentuates what's always been an important strand in US policy, the tendency to emphasize promotion of American values. Now, this has been evident in all post-Cold War presidencies to varying degrees. Uh, this sort of moralism was least emphasized in the administrations of the first Bush, uh, Bush the Elder, and Obama, uh, and most in those of Clinton and Bush the Younger. Uh, but it's always been a significant factor. Uh, as usual in American history, uh, there's a general assumption that Western democratic values are universal values, and US action to implement them is simply action on behalf of what's self-evidently right. Uh, as Lewis Hartz pointed out in his classic book, The Liberal Tradition in America, Americans think of themselves as pragmatic and non-ideological, uh, failing to recognize how intensely ideological they really are, because they take their worldview for granted as the natural order of things. And within the United States, the only political debates are between different strands of liberalism. Now, this refers to liberalism in the classic sense, uh, of the prime values of liberty and democracy, not the colloquial sense in which the word has come to mean left of center in American politics. The importance of values combined with overwhelming power tends to substitute attention to policy objectives for attention to strategy for how to achieve the objectives, or in effect to conflate objectives with strategy. I would argue that this is one of the main problems with grand strategy or strategy at any level in the United States. Politicians think of it in terms of objectives, 
and military officers tend to think of it in terms of operations. And neither orientation focuses sufficiently on the fact that strategy is not objectives or operations, but it's the plan that bridges the two, the scheme for using operations to achieve objectives. But because of the tendency of politicians and military professionals to focus on the different ends of the bridge, rather than the bridge of strategy itself, confusion often results. Why else should one be skeptical of whether we really have a grand strategy? A prime reason, I would argue, is that the US Constitution is anti-strategic. That is, the founders were most concerned with constraining power of government. So they bound it with checks and balances. And checks and balances impair consistent plans or decisive action. Unlike parliamentary systems with no possibility of divided government, power in American government is widely dispersed between and within the branches. This works in favor of inconsistency and compromise, which reduces the coherence of policy or strategy. If we speak of American grand strategy, whose grand strategy do we mean? The president's, one might assume, since he's the commander in chief. But what happens when his secretaries of state and defense disagree bitterly, as happened between Colin Powell and Donald Rumsfeld, for example? or when congressional pressure or appropriations push policy choices in other directions. And for how long does a plan have to run to qualify as a grand strategy? Grand strategy implies a plan meant to play out over the long term. But power changes hands frequently in a democracy. True, one administration's actions can tie the hands of another's to some extent as George Bush's decision to invade and remake Iraq left Obama with an entanglement he couldn't easily escape, even though Obama had opposed the original decision to launch the war. But Bush could not ensure that Obama would indefinitely plug away at the Bush strategy. So unless an administration has a strategy that can be implemented and brought to fruition quickly, while it's in power, it can have no assurance that its grand strategy will be pursued long enough to work. The US government is not good at long-term strategy because its political system is designed to prevent long-term authority for any political leader. This jerking back and forth is terribly frustrating to the military who crave clear guidance and predictable parameters for planning. But there really will never be, can never be, really reliable long-term planning of objectives and strategy within American government. I don't mean to exaggerate uh, this problem, but certainly the complexity of the government uh, with all the interest groups, turf fights, and pet projects that are represented, and the frequent turnover in political power make clarity and consistency in national strategy less than an armchair strategist would hope. Grand strategy for the long haul depends in principle on identifying the right trajectory and keeping on it. Uh, in real political and diplomatic life, however, there often is no long haul. Trajectories don't last. They breed their own negation by encouraging reactions or accumulating costs or overextending efforts. Unpredictable events knock policy and strategy off course. Uh, these events are external and internal. Unanticipated opportunities or reverses in the international sphere and domestic political reactions to these events, or transfers of power due to domestic developments, or the influence of specific personalities. There was a long-lasting trajectory of sorts in the Cold War for 40-odd years. But even then, despite fundamental continuity, there were major ups and downs and shifts, of course, that were unanticipated in the formative days of containment. For example, retrenchment after the disaster in Vietnam, detente, and then soon after that, reinvigorated conflict with the Soviet Union. Uh, overnight switch from intense hostility to tacit alignment with China, and so forth. Surprising events have a way of changing the agenda and making priorities and plans obsolete. On September 10th, 2001, 
No one uh, anticipated that counterterrorism would become the main driving force behind U.S. strategy. Uh, now, such fundamentally <coughs> upsetting surprises are not unusual in derailing assumptions behind any grand strategy. In fact, they've happened regularly since the United States became a superpower. Strategists have to work within a paradox. They can't count on foreseeing the principal threats and opportunities that will emerge in coming years. They're likely to be surprised. Yet they still need to plan against other possibilities that they can foresee. Now, if you think that smart, hardworking expert strategists should be expected to estimate the dangers that will preoccupy foreign policymakers, consider these questions. In May 1950, who would have predicted that America's next war would be in a place called Korea? Few Americans at that time had ever heard of Korea. At the end of the Korean War, who would have predicted that America's next war would be in Vietnam? In 1988, who would have predicted, without being sent to a mental hospital, that within three years, the Berlin Wall would open, the Cold War would end, the Soviet's East European Empire would be liberated, and the Soviet Union itself would cease to exist. In May 1990, who would have predicted that America's next wars would be in Iraq, Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Iraq again? Indeed, who would have predicted that the United States would face twice as many small wars in the 20 years after the Cold War as it fought in more than 40 years during the Cold War? So is it hopeless to think that we can have any advanced control over future threats and opportunities? No. Some potential risks can't be foreseen, but others can be, and appropriate preparations can prevent disaster. In the Cold War, for example, the power of the Soviet Union posed uh, an obvious challenge. The government undertook measures to counter and safeguard against it in the areas of greatest importance, Europe and Japan. And if the Soviets ever had any temptation to attack these vital interests, American and allied preparations deterred them. Eventually, these efforts paid off handsomely in the stunning, peaceful victory that ended the Cold War. Where are we now? The war on terror more or less took over grand strategy after September 11th. It's what caused the invasion of Afghanistan, since the Taliban refused to extradite al-Qaeda. And it's what George Bush mistakenly used as part of the excuse for launching the war in Iraq. Uh, it's a mistake, however, to make it the, grand, uh, the, the driver of grand strategy now, if it ever was. Terrorism became a grave threat only by default, because of the absence of other major threats. Since September 11th, it's counterintuitive to downplay the danger posed by al-Qaeda, and I certainly don't mean to minimize it, but the danger would seem smaller if we faced a hostile great power. With terrorism, too, the main concern now is the adversary's access to weapons of mass destruction. Typical terrorism has a psychological impact that far outweighs its material impact. Typical terrorism actually kills very few people and even fewer Americans. September 11th was a huge exception. But even a disaster like September 11th, once every decade, would impose less damage objectively uh, than Americans are accustomed to absorbing from other risks. Uh, the threat from terrorists becomes truly great only if they're able to get and use nuclear or biological weapons that could inflict casualties in the tens or hundreds of thousands. Otherwise, it's the capabilities and intentions of major states that should preoccupy grand strategy, because of the, those are the things that matter over the long term and especially uh, uh, some years down the road from now. In any case, what is grand strategy for the war on terror? I would call it an unlimited war of attrition, a combination of offensive action to find, fight, and eliminate as many members of al-Qaeda as possible, and defensive investments and in measures to insulate U.S. territory from infiltration. Uh, in principle, there's a loftier strategy. 
foreign intervention and public diplomacy to win the war of ideas, deprive al-Qaeda and its ilk of sympathetic areas they can use as a base of operations, and convince Muslims that the United States is not their enemy. In practice, it's hard to measure how initiatives beyond forcible attrition are panning out. I don't see any subtlety or art uh, in our actual anti-terrorist grant strategy, and for the most part, that may be as it should be. The most direct measures to prevent terrorist acquisition of weapons of mass destruction, on the other hand, are a subset of strategy for preventing revolution or radical coup d'etat in Pakistan, since that's the most plausible way in which al-Qaeda might be able to get nuclear weapons. As for other threats that might emerge, American power and primacy are the dominant conditioning factors. Uh, it's worth mentioning, however, that global unipolarity may coincide with regional multipolarity. There's only one worldwide superpower, but U.S. power is fractionated by its commitment in most of the regions of the world regions within which there are other significant powers. In some of these regions, the United States is the first among equals, but it still requires the cooperation of allies to operate strategically with assured effectiveness at acceptable cost. The significance of this difference between global unipolarity and regional multipolarity is probably greatest in East Asia, where the United States holds the balance, but other major powers, Japan, China, Russia, are crucial players. Another important element of context is domestic political consensus. The exercise of primacy has been popular across the political spectrum inside the United States. This popularity may be waning under the strain of inconclusive and messy wars and panic about fiscal disaster, but there's still no clear change of course. Uh, indeed, Despite Iraq and Afghanistan, Obama did not shrink from taking on Libya last year, uh, although with decisive initiatives to shift the burden to allies as much as possible. In regard to the general aim of using U.S. power to shape world order, uh, the only dissenters have been outside the political mainstream, figures on the far right and far left, the Pat Buchanans and Ron Pauls on one hand, the Ralph Nader's and Dennis Kucinich's on the other. The popularity of primacy is due to two main things. First, until the costs of Iraq and Afghanistan accumulated, primacy was relatively cheap in terms of effort expended. It was easy to enjoy being number one when it didn't cost much. Uh, even as the costs in blood and treasure accumulated, the American public and Congress have been permissive. Uh, and while certain parts of the population, people like you, have borne very high costs, most Americans have borne next to no costs uh, in fighting the wars we've uh, been in in recent years. Uh, and not only is there no conscription, not only do most Americans have no family members uh, in the military, uh, but their taxes weren't even raised. Indeed, this may be the first period of war uh, in history where taxes were cut during wartime. Uh, despite long and inconclusive combat, there's still no anti-war movement of any consequence in the United States. Certainly nothing uh, that doesn't look infinitesimal compared to the dissent generated by the long and inconclusive war in Vietnam. Second, there's little if any recognition by the public that primacy can generate problems as well as solve them, that it can make the U.S. a target for aggrieved groups who blame us for thwarting their ambitions. The most important aspect of the context of American preeminence is the absence of current challenges from hostile great powers. Our biggest state enemies at present are so-called rogue states, middle powers we barely noticed back in the bad old days of the Cold War. The rogue state problem is in part a vicious circle. The main reason we care about North Korea and Iran, <clears throat> and the only reason that we fear them, is the weapons of mass destruction they hold or may be trying to get. <coughs> and of course, that was how George Bush justified starting the war in Iraq. None of the rogue states have significant political or diplomatic cards to play otherwise. 
although Iran has some leverage via oil. Their interest in having weapons of mass destruction, in turn, is, if not primarily, at least in significant part, due to their vulnerability to us. The government of North Korea, once under the wing of the Soviet Union, is now on its own with a somewhat ambivalent uh, and limited ally in China. Uh, and the Iranian regime is on even clearer notice that we would like to put it out of business. Uh, their only hope of deterring the principal threat to their survival, us, is weapons of mass destruction. But of course, their pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, and for simplicity's sake, I'm assuming that that's what they're up to, even though that's not certain. Uh, that's what energizes our attempts to accelerate their demise. U.S. grant strategy toward these two countries is a bit ambiguous. First, coercion via sanctions to induce Iran to negotiate its capability to build nuclear weapons away. If that doesn't work, at a minimum, containment and deterrence, or at a maximum, preventive war again. The latter option seemed to come off the table, but Obama brought it back. Uh, indeed, in my personal opinion, uh, he has boxed the United States in to some extent when he said some months ago that he does not have a policy of containment on Iran, uh, implying that he would use force if sanctions don't prevent Iran from uh, moving to get nuclear weapons. For national security policy, the main concern has, uh, always has to be the possibility of conflict with great powers or to use the beltway term of art, peer competitors. No such competitor is yet in the ring with us. The contender on the horizon, though, of course, is China, which still has a way to go to compete on our level. As time goes on, however, it's looming steadily larger. The main question here is whether the United States will try to constrain China from asserting its strategic ambitions altogether by pressing a rigid strategy of containment, or will accord China status as the dominant power on the mainland of Asia, tacitly recognizing that it's entitled to a sphere of influence like other great powers in history? The optimists, economic interdependence and mutual interests in profit from trade should make the danger of war obsolete. Uh, but if China's rise does not produce increasing political friction with the United States, uh, this will be a historically unusual achievement. If China's economic growth continues at even half the rate of recent times, it will be a superpower before long. Now, this is not inevitable. There could be economic or political developments that derail China's rise. And it's conceivable that we Americans will find a miraculous way to dig ourselves out of debt and reinvigorate our status as number one above all others in the world. The best bet at present, however, is that not far down the road, China will be an economic power rivaling the United States, perhaps even surpassing it in gross domestic product, even if not equaling it in per capita terms and overall economic strength. At that point, it will be only natural for Beijing to believe that it deserves the same influence and prerogatives in international affairs as the United States has had and to have as free a hand in shaping the regional order in its own neighborhood in Asia as the United States traditionally has had in our neighborhood in the Western Hemisphere. If the United States resists the extension of Chinese influence, especially if we intervene to prevent Beijing from taking control of Taiwan, the stage is set for conflict. And what are the odds that Washington will back away and give China a free hand in Asia? That would represent a reversal of more than 100 years of US involvement in shaping the Asian balance of power. We may find a way to accommodate China's rise peacefully, but it will take work. And unless the Chinese do us the favor of accepting an inferior status in international politics, it will require us to make some concessions. The main issue is how the Taiwan problem evolves. Americans have been too complacent, in my view, in assuming that the status quo can continue indefinitely. This complacency has been possible because Beijing uh, has been very patient and has not pushed its demands for reunification to the top of its foreign policy agenda, yet. 
Chinese spokesmen have made clear, though, that the question of Taiwan's reincorporation in the People's Republic of China is a question of when and how, not whether. Since 1996, U.S. policy has moved further toward committing the United States to defend Taiwan after having backed away in the period of rapprochement with the PRC. Uh, and this recent uh, move towards more commitment to Taiwan has occurred even though we do not recognize it as an independent country and China considers it a rebellious province. To me, this is a recipe for crisis at some point in the future, a crisis that would put us militarily at odds with a nuclear-armed great power for the first time since the height of the Cold War. In short, this is one crucial area where U.S. grand strategy is unclear and risky, but mainly because American uh, leaders have not forthrightly or definitely decided what price we should be willing to pay to prevent Taiwan's conquest, or how big a risk of escalation to major war we should be willing to run. On a smaller scale, but more immediately, we face this ambiguity in regard to China's disputes with various Southeast Asian countries over islands in the South China Sea, especially the recent conflict with the Philippines over Scarborough Shoal. Should the United States support its ally, the Philippines, militarily, with all the attendant risks on an issue of such small importance? For better or worse, U.S. policy on this is still quite unclear. We can't have a clear strategy if we have not made a clear determination of the stakes, options, and risks. <coughs> Our grand strategy in principle is to engage China, promote cooperation, and encourage Beijing's restraint, and retain a strong emphasis on deployment of U.S. naval and air power in the Western Pacific uh, as a hedge. But that's a wishful strategy for affecting Chinese intentions not a robust strategy for either resisting or retreating if restraint doesn't work. Is China the only potential great power challenger to the United States? After the dust up in Georgia a few summers ago, one might worry that uh, Russia's back and it will be a problem like the old Soviet Union was. Uh, and one of the uh, candidates for president in the fall has argued that Russia is our number one geopolitical foe. Uh, I think U.S. relations with Russia may deteriorate, but it's unlikely to pose anything remotely like the threat that the old Soviet Union did. First, Russia's barely half the size of the old Soviet Union in terms of population. Second, not only the Soviet Union's old allies, the Warsaw Pact countries of Eastern Europe, but even a number of former Soviet republics, countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states, are now on the other side, our side, members of NATO. The balance of power between Russia and the West is completely lopsided in our favor. Indeed, Russia has more reason to feel insecure now than we do in Europe. Third, Russia's economy, in a shambles for years after the Cold War, recovered recently, but pretty much only due to the rise in oil prices, which is not a durable basis for robust growth. Fourth, Russia's in severe demographic decline. Its population is just, uh, is not only not growing, it's actually shrinking. Nevertheless, despite the odds in the West's favor, the crisis is not out of the question if the United States and our European allies persist in plans for admission of Georgia and Ukraine to NATO, and Russia decides that it's had enough of being surrounded and tries to prevent such action. In terms of the threat of a growing great power adversary, however, China has uh, more of the prerequisites. What forces are pushing against the recent trajectory? This situation could last for a long time. It could turn out to be much more than a unipolar moment. If so, it will be because other major states do not band together against us. Will they or won't they? put the question in political science jargon, will international politics in coming years be marked by balancing or bandwagoning? That is, will states who resent American power and arrogance 
collaborate to form a counterweight to cut us down to size, or will they fear isolation and subordination and run after us, whatever we do, for fear of falling by the wayside? Uh, there have been indications in both directions. For the most part, however, the pattern so far seems to be bandwagoning. France, Russia, and China combined against the United States occasionally in the UN Security Council. But when the chips have been down, they've often caved in and let us have our way. But the development most obviously shifting prospects away from American primacy is the rise of China. The sobering implications of that development are reinforced by indicators of American decline. Not absolute decline, necessarily, but relative decline as China continues to narrow the gap in power by continuing to grow at a faster rate than we do. There's nothing inevitable about such decline, but it's a probability made evident by the economic collapse of the past few years in the West and the lack of a domestic grand strategy for restoring economic vitality, the lack of an internal grand strategy that bridges the chasm between the two national political parties. U.S. primacy in general comes into increasing doubt as long as both trends, the rise of China and the economic sickness of the United States and Europe, continue. The most immediate manifestation of the second problem is the pressure to reduce U.S. defense spending. Personally, I think defense spending has been excessive since the Cold War, but that's because I would have stipulated less ambitious missions for the American military in the past 20 years. In any case, the prospect of reductions in the defense budget uh, is now pretty certain, uh, and it will be jarring for the military establishment because we became accustomed to sustained annual increases in the DOD budget for the past dozen years, a situation unprecedented even during the Cold War when base defense budgets never grew for more than three years in a row. Uh, the fact that the share of the economy allocated to the military has remained lower than during the Cold War allowed many to think of the defense budget as modest, even though the percentage of GDP for defense is far higher than it ever was in peacetime before the Cold War, and even though the absolute level of budgets meant that the United States accounted for almost half of all military spending in the world and well over five times the military spending of all our potential enemies combined. It's a truism that the viability of a strong national security policy rests on the underpinning of a strong economy. So in this sense, even an ambitious grand strategy for the future uh, depends on devising a sustainable domestic grand strategy for economic recovery which depends on political compromise and belt tightening all around, including in the defense budget itself. There are other ways in which uh, any ambitious grand strategy will depend on domestic sacrifices that the body politic has yet to show any signs of facing, for example, in energy policy. One potential threat uh, that, at least until very recently, and I would argue still should be, one of the major drivers of strategy is potential interruption of our oil supplies. Very recently, this vulnerability seems to have gone away as internal development of oil and gas have come back. Uh, and for the moment, at least, we seem practically self-sufficient. Uh, even if this situation deteriorates again, it's highly unlikely that the United States could face anything close to a complete cutoff of oil imports because there's still a large number of oil exporters in different parts of the world. If one or more major suppliers stopped exporting, the price of oil would skyrocket and consumption would decline, but the country would not grind to a halt. The problem, however, is that a large proportion of world oil reserves are in the unstable region of the Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and the smaller states of the Persian Gulf. If exports to us and our allies were interrupted from several of these suppliers due to revolutions, invasions, or collusion, like that of the Arab oil embargo in 1973, the effect could be disastrous. The main solutions to this vulnerability that we've chosen so far are the buildup of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and the development of military capabilities through central command to fight in the Persian Gulf. The latter were exercised in part for the purpose of energy security in the first war against Iraq in 1991. 
That turned out to be an amazingly easy military success, which may have tempted our leaders to think that military power could be used effectively in other difficult situ situations in the Middle East uh, at modest cost. Rolling back a conventional Iraqi army that had invaded another country, Kuwait, however, is not as difficult a task as using American military forces to counter revolutions, suppress insurgencies, and secure friendly governments in unstable countries. The problems uh, we've faced in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Pakistan in the past decade. There is a way to reduce our energy dependence and vulnerability to coercion, a way that's within our control, it's well recognized, and which a number of Americans have advocated, but most Americans <coughs> have not wanted to do to the full extent possible, even before the upsurge in domestic production eased our vulnerability. Uh, this is where foreign policy and domestic policy meet. Uh, the aim here for the long term, as opposed to the moment, would be to significantly reduce oil consumption and increase incentives to deploy other means of generating energy. There are various initiatives in this direction, but nothing as significant as a large federal tax on gasoline would be. Uh, a solution that is, seems pretty much out of the question politically. Another question uh, in which general trend will most characterize the evolution of world politics, uh, that is, which general trend uh, will most characterize it? Uh, globalization, or what uh, has been called the clash of civilizations. In short, will modernization prove to be synonymous with westernization around the world? leading to political globalization on the model of Western liberal democracy on the same scale as the economic globalization of Western capitalism? Or will other countries refuse to be homogenized culturally and resist the promulgation of American values within their societies? The future of the war and terror may hinge on this question. A grand strategy that attempts to shepherd the world toward the American model will be one that, at least in the short term, combines with other abrasions to aggravate friction with anti-American movements like radical Islamism. Can the war on terrorism be separated from a clash of civilizations, or at least a clash of cultures, even if we want it to be? The campaign against Al-Qaeda, along with the provocations of Al-Qaeda, foster polarization in the Muslim world, as Muslims in the middle who have not previously taken sides with either the Islamic radicals or the regimes that oppose them, uh, and the United States as a supporter of those regimes and now a direct antagonist of the radicals, as those Muslims in the middle feel pressed to choose one side or the other. Americans uh, don't see the war on terrorism as a war against Islam, but it's a big strategic challenge to keep Muslims from seeing it that way. What should we aim for? Uh, there's a good analytical survey of grand strategy alternatives by Barry Posen and Andrew Ross published in the journal International Security uh, in 1996-97. Uh, it doesn't adequately cover the salience of counterterrorism in the post-September 11th world, but it does cover the main basic choices theoretically in how to approach the world. And the choices remain remark remarkably relevant well into the 21st century. They offer a range of choices in ambition and method for linking objectives uh, and assumptions about how the world works and military programs. Uh, I won't summarize their article, but commend it to those who want a good detailed survey of the alternatives to organize your thinking and your internal mental debate. If I had to choose one of their alternatives, uh, their four alternatives were neo-isolationism, uh, cooperative security, selective engagement, and primacy. But if I had to choose one, it would be selective engagement. More activist than the extreme of isolationism, but with a presumption that restraint should be the default option. Anyone interested in details of my views can see my recent book, American Force, for the full version, or for the short version, an essay I have in a collection on grand strategy just published by the Center for New American Security in Washington. Uh, I confess to being cautious by disposition and, I have to admit, a pessimist by instinct. I'm skeptical 
that muscular American interventionism can be sustained without undercutting itself, generating problems as much as solving them. I can't yet claim that evidence supports the case for retrenchment, for soft peddling primacy, and shifting toward a balance of power strategy, but I do believe that over time that's a less risky approach than energetic attempts to remake the world in our image. The Wilsonian impulse hesitantly evident in the 1990s, which was, by the way, rejected by George Bush during the presidential campaign in the year 2000, but embraced by him when he was traumatized by September 11th. I recommend a more cautious grand strategy, but I don't expect it. It's not in the nature of unchallenged power to forswear itself. It's unnatural and unlikely for the United States not to keep pushing its advantage until it runs into a rude surprise. And even then, if the shock is one that is seen by citizens as unprovoked, as the assault on September 11th was seen, such a reverse could simply harden and accelerate an aggressive bent. It's not in the nature of overwhelming power to renounce an ambitious course, but it's also unlikely that American hegemony will last as long as Rome's did, even if it turns out to be longer than a unipolar moment. A wise grand strategy, in my view, for a long haul may not be possible for reasons I've suggested, but if it were, it would be one that looks ahead to the connection between the period of maximum leverage and the period in which others narrow the gap. In my view, the best grand strategy would manage the transition away from American hegemony while we still have it and don't have to make the transition by retreating under duress. This would mean many things that have no apparent chance of being accepted and which most American foreign policy elite would find frightful. For example, welcoming European political unity and reducing the profile of NATO relative to that of the EU, conceding to Russia and China's spheres of influence in their land border areas, a more even-handed policy in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a serious energy policy that reduces dependence on fossil fuel and other unlikely changes. So since my preferred grand strategy is almost certain not to be adopted under anything like current circumstances, and since I'm mildly pessimistic about our likely course, I'm reminded once again of uh, how I hope to turn out to be wrong. <laughs>